you ever felt like running away? I mean, you're running away from everything. I've already done that. I've already done that. You know, maybe the, the pressure of life, maybe it's in a bad situation. Maybe it's a troubled relationship. Maybe it's a financial problem. Maybe it's a problem with your job. Maybe you're scared. Maybe uh, a loved one has got sick or passed away and you just don't understand it. And you just really, you feel like laying everything you got down and just running as far away from everything, including God, as you possibly can. Well, maybe you already know by the video trailer that uh, our faithful deserter is a man by the name of Mark. More accurately, his name is John Mark. His account of the teachings and the life of Jesus, what we call the Gospel. And this morning, I want you to know that John Mark gives us hope and he gives us instructions and he gives comfort to those who feel like quitting and running away when life just simply gets tough or the pressure gets too much to handle or maybe it's even the fear of what's going on. John Mark gives both of those that are far, far, far away from God, those who are very near to God, he gives both of them instruction, hope, and comfort. So the good news of that we're going to be talking about this one is that this, this good news is for everybody. Now the word we translate gospel comes from the Greek, and the word actually means good news. So you know it can't be anything but good news if it's gospel. So the good news is no matter where you're at in your relationship with God, John Mark this morning has news for you, and he has good news for you. So, if you're very, very far away from Jesus, if you're not sure who <coughs> Jesus is, or maybe you were very near Jesus at one time, and now you've run away from him, John Mark gives us hope. He gives us comfort. He says, I've got something here in the very beginning of my gospel that's for everybody that ever reads it, which means it's for me and it's for you. Now, if you're one of those people who don't like a lot of scripture. If you're like me, you like to study, you like the facts, you're very analytical, you have picked absolutely the perfect day to be at church because that's what we're going to do today. This is an introduction lesson. And in an introduction lesson, there's very little scripture. We just sort of point out the facts and hope they pique your interest and whet your appetite so that you'll come back. So before we get started, I, I want to tell you what we want to do and what we want to accomplish today, and I promise that we're going to get you out of here on time. If you like me, you like to watch a clock, you like to know what time it is, you got a schedule, you got things to do. So normally we're out of here by about 11.30, and I promise you I'm going to try to get you out right on time. So the first thing I want to do is I want to tell you some facts about John Mark himself. The second thing I want to do is tell you uh, some of the facts, some of the interesting things that I find about the gospel of Mark himself. And then I want to tell you a, a little bit uh, about my story. A little bit about my personal testimony. Now, I want to ask you, please, 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 when you hear this portion, this snippet of my Odyssey, <coughs> keep in mind, Odyssey means a spiritual journey, with many ups and downs. My prayer has been twofold. First of all, no matter where you're at, no matter how much sin you've been in, no matter how much sin you may still be in, how much sin you're thinking about getting in, you can find hope through the story of a guy who was in the very pits of sin. And number two, you don't leave the church because you didn't think anything about it like me. <laughs> All they even think about being a pastor. And, you know, fortunately the Bible addresses uh, that very subject. You know, there's a time when, when Jesus, he's at, he's at one of the uh, very religious people, one of the high priest's house. And as he's talking and he's teaching, this lady busts through the door. And she's a well-known prostitute. Everybody in there knows who she is. They know what she does for a living. They know her sin. And this lady just walks up and kneels down at the feet of Jesus and she begins to cry and she begins to wipe his feet with her, her hair and, and she puts this very expensive perfume and it mixes with her tears and, and she's just, just thanking Jesus and, and, and rubbing this oil and, and her tears in his feet. And, and you might imagine the religious people, they're very offended. And they're thinking to themselves, if Jesus knew who that was, he'd never let them. He'd never let her do that. Huh. Now, I want you to think about this, you know. 
what would happen, now, and, I, and I have to tell you, please, please, please don't think that I'm comparing myself to Jesus. It's just an illustration. You're watching the news last night. There's a big crime in Shelbyville, and it's very public. It's a national crime, and the person's on TV, and all of a sudden they come to the door, and they start coming in here, and they're crying, and they're at the altar, and they're, they're blabbering, and they're wiping water on my feet and oil and all that. You all probably get a little nervous, wouldn't you? Maybe even get a little upset. Because you know what they've done. They knew where they were. And again, this is just an illustration. If you were a big church, man, security would be coming out from everywhere. They'd be grabbing them, taking them in a room, and calling 911. But that's not what Jesus does. Luke, the author of the book of Acts, he, he tells us, he says, when he, when he uh, meaning Peter, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, Jesus knows what everybody's thinking. Jesus knows what uh, the people in the room are thinking. He knows what this girl's been guilty of. He knows what she's asking, and she's asking forgiveness. So he just says this. He says, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, they have been forgiven. She has shown me so much love. But a person who has been forgiven little shows only a little love. And then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. So my sins, and there were many, have been forgiven. And the more you know how much Jesus had to forgive you for, the more you fall in love with Jesus. Amen. Amen. See, if you don't Amen. know what you've done, if you're not feeling some kind of remorse, if you haven't repented of it, it's really hard to know how much Jesus loved you. And you look back on your life and you say, you know, if somebody had done all this, you look at me just as if I was as clean as the newborn stone. So, the reason John Mark is called the faithful deserter, deserter is because that's exactly what he was. John Mark was the son of a very wealthy, a very prominent Jewish Christian woman. People met at her house. It was, it was a large church. And, and by the description we get in the book of Acts, which you'll hear later, uh, we know that she had to be wealthy. And, and even though his mother was Jewish, we believe that his father was probably Roman or Greek. The reason for that is John is from the Jewish heritage and Mark is from the Latin, his Roman heritage. And again, the reason we decided to name this uh, series, Seeing Jesus Through the Eyes of a Faithful Deserter, is because that's exactly what John Mark was. When things got tough, the tough quit and ran. The first mention we ever see of John Mark is in the Gospel of Acts. And in this section, we see that John Mark is about to accompany Paul and Barnabas, and a team of people are heading to go to Asia Minor. Well, the scripture says, the very next couple of verses, the eight verses, the next verse that mentions John Mark, says this. It says, when he, meaning Peter, realized he went home of, I'm sorry, he didn't <coughs> The first mention we have of John Mark in Scripture chapter 12 where Peter has escaped from jail. I apologize, I got ahead of myself. Peter escaped from jail with the help of an angel. Now, now if you've never read the story of Jesus escaping, or uh, Peter escaping jail with the help of an angel in Acts chapter 12, I encourage you to, to read that. Now, I know it sort of sounds weird. You know, how, how, how did the angel come and appear and open the doors? But that's exactly what the Scripture says. And it's a fantastic story. It's fascinating. So I would just ask you to, to go home and read that. But the first mention we have of John Mark is actually in that very section of scripture. As Peter is escaped jail by the help of the angel, it says that when he, meaning Peter, realized this, he went home to the to Mary, he went home to the home of Mary, the all the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. So the next picture we get of John Mark. So that's the first picture, him going, uh, Peter going to his mother's house where, where John Mark was. The next picture we get is, is where uh, John Mark in, in uh, Acts chapter 16 is getting on a boat with uh, Paul and with Barnabas and several others. And they're headed to Asia Minor for Paul's, actually his first mission trip to that area. Now, what we find out is John Mark couldn't take the pressure. Just eight verses later, uh, we see the Apostle Paul splitting ways with John Mark. John Mark tags along, but it doesn't last very long. John Mark accompanies the Apostle Paul to Asia Minor, and then we see these souls landing in the town of Perga. There, John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. And we don't know if John Mark was scared, whether he was homesick, 
uh, whether he actually got physically ill. Uh, what we do know is him leaving really upset Paul. And the other scriptures tell us that Paul just, he lost all faith in him. John Mark, he, he was mad, he was angry, he, he got in a big fight with Barnabas, and uh, because Barnabas wanted to take him on the next trip, and Paul didn't want to take him, uh, Paul's like, uh, nobody likes a quitter, and quitters never win, and winners never quit. And Paul just don't want anything to do with John Mark. But that's not the only time John Mark quit and ran, that's not the only time that uh, he deserted. Uh, he deserted at a time when Jesus needed him the most. It was on the night that uh, Jesus would be betrayed. It was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Mark couldn't shake his fear again. John Mark couldn't stick around. John Mark couldn't take the pressure. So he just hightails it. He runs away from God in a box. He runs away from God himself. Jesus Christ on the night that Jesus needs him the most. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garden was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Almost all theologians agree that John Mark was worth telling on himself. So here's the good part of the Gospel of Mark right off the bat. Here's the good news that John Mark shows you. It doesn't matter. If you felt like the weight of the world was on your shoulders, if you've ever been so scared of what was going on in your life, if you've ever felt like running around and naked, well, you're in great company. If you've ever been angry at God and you find yourself far, far, far away from God, John Mark shows us that no matter how far you are away, God is still there. You may leave him, but he ain't never going to leave you. Amen. Now, if that wasn't the case, Amen. we wouldn't have the Gospel of Mark in our Bibles today. And the good part about it is we know reconciliation with man and reconciliation with God is possible because at the end of Paul's life, in the very last letter he would ever write before he was beheaded for his faith, in the very last chapter he begins to close the letter by saying, please bring John Mark with you when you come or he will be helpful in my ministry. Now here's a man that split ways with, with one of his missionary partners over this guy, and we know that reconciliation with man is possible, because here at the end of Paul's ministry, right before he goes to the, the Acts, he says, please bring John Mark, because he is helpful in my ministry. So that's good news for all people, because who hasn't felt like running away at some time? Who hasn't felt like just giving up and going somewhere far, far away. Who hasn't been mad at God at some time for something that's happened in your life? And, and the Gospel of Mark starts out by saying, it doesn't matter if you're very, very far away or you're very, very near. This Gospel, this God loves you, and it's for everybody. Now again, if you're a person who doesn't like a bunch of facts, maybe today's message is not going to appeal to you. So I'm going to ask you to come back next week, or if you're a person that doesn't come very often, you come occasionally, I'm going to challenge you to come on a regular basis for five weeks. Strive for five. Strive for five consecutive weeks to come to the Odyssey Church and just give us a chance. You know, maybe you come today and we've got an off day. Maybe you come today and it just doesn't feel comfortable there. Or the message doesn't appeal to you. You know, strive for five. Come five weeks consecutively and see if God doesn't do something great in your life and see if the Odyssey Church isn't a church that helps people find and follow Jesus. There may be bigger churches, there may be more talented churches, there may be better preachers, but I can promise you this, you won't find a church that will love you as much as this church will love you. There won't be a church that will pour into your family and pour into you and pour into your friends like this church will. That's right. So as I promised, I, I, I want to tell you some of the history about John Mark himself, and I want to tell you some facts about the book of Mark itself. And the first thing that we need to know, or I think you should know, is Mark is one of what they call three synoptic gospels. S-Y-N, sin, comes in great, from the Greek word meaning having the same function. An optic, you know, that means to see. So synoptic literally means taking a common view or, or seeing the same. Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very, very similar. Even though each of the Gospels are different in style, even though each one were different in length, they each one emphasized a different thing. Last year we went through the Gospel of Matthew, and the Gospel of Matthew shows Jesus as King, as Lord. 
Gospel of Mark, the main verse is in uh, Mark 10, 45, and, and it talks where Jesus says, you know, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve. So we see a picture of the suffering servant in the Gospel of Mark. But you have to know that Jesus is your King and your Lord before you can know Him as a suffering servant. So not only do I believe that the Word of God itself is inspired, I believe the order of the Gospels, the order of the books is inspired as well. So even though they all are different in length and emphasis and they're different in style, they all have this common thread. And this common thread is the proclaiming of the good news of Jesus Christ. Now the other thing that I think that, that you should know is the Gospel of Mark was actually the first Gospel that was written. You know, they're not written Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. The Gospel of Mark is actually, most theologians, theologians believe uh, that Mark was written first. Now, now, if you went back about 50 years, they would say Matthew was written first, but we find out that's probably not the case. Uh, and it's hard to really pinpoint exactly when Mark was written, but we believe that it was written somewhere between 50 and 55 A.D. and 70 A.D. Probably closer to 55, maybe even as late as 65 A.D., but depending on who you read and what, re and what they base their facts on, we know it was done between 50 and, and 70 A.D., so, so that is um, a, a pretty narrow field. Uh, A.D., again, means that of the Menai, which means in the year of the Lord. So, now, we know this because in 70 A.D., the Jerusalem temple, the temple in Jerusalem, was destroyed, and there's no mention of this in the Gospel of Mark at all. And, and a historic uh, event that, that Jesus had prophesied himself, if it was written after 70 A.D., then the first gospel would be written would be probably include that. And since there's no mention of it, we know it was probably written before 70 A.D. And the reason we know it was written after 50 or 55 A.D. is John Mark wrote his gospel, is that most people believe that John Mark got all his information, or at least most of his information, from the Apostle Peter. Uh, John Mark was probably only about 14 years old uh, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus Christ. So he knew Jesus, he had met Jesus, but he probably wasn't one of his regular followers. But Peter had followed him for three and a half years. Peter was one of his closest friends, closest disciples when he walked here on earth. And, and, and so much so, there's a, lot, there's a lot of people who think this ought to be called the Gospel of Peter and, and not the Gospel of Mark. And again, you know, just as you think about the facts, think about the hope that's just in the facts themselves. You know, to me, the fact that it's Peter and, and John Mark that put this together, that, that John Mark is actually scripting what Peter is telling him, gives me even more hope because we know, or most of us should know, that, that, that Peter denied Christ. And John Mark deserted Christ. So you have a dropout and a deserter, and you also have a denier, and, and they come together and Christ forgives them. Christ says, hey, it's like it's never happened when you come and you repent, and that's good news. Because we've all denied and deserted and dropped out at times. So I think that this gospel is one of the most important gospels we find, but they're all important. Whether you've ever deserted God or whether you've ever denied God, the gospel of Mark gives us this truth that God still loves us and he desires us to have a relationship with him. Now, most people believe that when, like I said, when John Mark ran around naked, he was only about 14 years old. So, what most of the theologians uh, think happened, we, we know that uh, Peter was at John Mark's house a lot, and, and as they were worshiping and as they were praying, Peter was telling these great stories, John Mark actually becomes a disciple of Peter. He goes with Peter wherever he goes. So, keep in mind, before the Gospel of Mark, there were no Gospels. There were no accounts of Jesus' life. There were no accounts of his teachings. There were no accounts of his miracles that were written down. Everything was circulated or, or delivered orally by the eyewitnesses themselves or by uh, people who were under the supervision of the eyewitnesses themselves. You know, we think sometimes the only evidence that we have of Jesus Christ in the Bible and all his miracles that he performed and the claims that he made about himself being the Son of God is the Bible itself. But, but when you start reading, you find out that's simply not true. There's a lot of secular evidence that Jesus Christ was exactly who he said he was. There was at least five or six historians at the time that record uh, Jesus' life, and, and actually they all claim that 
uh, Mark was so reliable, the Gospel of Mark was so reliable, you could actually take it into a court system at the time and use it for evidence. Mm -hmm. So, so we, we think that, you know, we got this, these ancient manuscripts that have been made up stories over the years, and, and, and yet secular history tells us that all of this is true. The problem at the time was the eyewitnesses were beginning to die out. Uh, if it's 55, 65 AD, you know, it's about 30, 35 years after the death of Jesus, and those that were around at the time were starting to grow old and are starting to die. Some believe that it was around 65 AD when the gospel was written because, you know, Paul was executed for his faith by being beheaded, and, and some think the catalyst to all this was the fact that Peter was killed for his faith. He was martyred. Now, now, tradition says that when it was time for Peter to die, he was going to be crucified, and Peter was actually crucified upside down. That, that Peter said, I'm not worthy of being crucified as my Lord was. Crucify me upside down. So that's exactly what they did. So, so the, Rome, the church in Rome had made a decision that this has to, uh, to be written down, and this has to... Uh, be recorded for historical facts. And John Mark was fluent in Aramaic and Greek, and uh, John Mark, uh, by the style, was uh, evidently very learned. He had uh, good written skills at the time. And Rome commissions John Mark to write the accounts of the teachings and the miracles and the life of Jesus Christ. And as a result, we have the first gospel of Mark the first written recording of Jesus and his story. Before that, it was all oral. Now, most people believe that when Matthew and Mark, or Matthew and Luke wrote their Gospels, they had a copy of Mark right in front. Now, the reason so many people believe that is, again, I haven't counted them. I did a lot of research. Somewhere between 40 and 50 verses. That's all the verses that are in Mark that aren't recorded in either Luke or in Matthew. <coughs> of all the hundreds of verses that are in the Gospel of Mark, and it's the shortest Gospel, all but about 25, most of them narrow it down to 25 to 31 verses, are used in the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew. They all said the same percentage. 97% of the Book of Mark is either found in the Gospel of Luke or the Gospel of Matthew. So most people believe that as Luke was uh, going around and, and, and telling the story and listening to Mary and writing things down. Uh, he also had the Gospel of Luke, uh, uh, Luke to go by. Now you can't get away with saying, well, I'm going to read Matthew and Luke and I don't have to read the Gospel of Mark because the Gospel of Mark produces and, and gives us a picture of Jesus Christ that no other Gospel does. If you don't read the Gospel of Mark, there's going to be a picture of Jesus that God wants to give you that you'll find in no other book of the Bible. Now that's just not the, uh, the, the Gospel of Mark. That's every book of the Bible. If you were to take out one book of the Bible, you would miss a picture of Jesus, because Jesus is from Genesis to Revelation, mm -hmm. that God would want us to see and know about His Son. Now I find all of this fascinating. You know, as I read this, I'm a very analytical person. I say it many times, faith comes hard with me. So, but as I read this, it makes the scriptures, this makes our Bible all the more real. I mean, for 2,000 years, people had tried to destroy this, and yet these ancient documents have survived and come together. They were written by many different authors over many different continents, and they come together with this common theme. But the problem is, if I'm really honest with you, it can be a little frightening, too. Because the more I believe in scriptures as a factual account of Jesus' life, the more I have to believe that Jesus is exactly who he said he was. And the more I believe that Jesus is exactly who he says he is, then I have to not only make him my Savior, that's the easy part. We were just doing the stitches the other day, there's something like 87% uh, uh, of all the United States consider themselves to be Christians. But you look around, I don't think that 87% of the people walking around today look and act like Jesus Christ. See, making him Savior is really easy. But the more I read, the more I study, the more I see that Jesus is exactly who he says he is, then the more I know that I have to start doing the things he tells
tells me to do. I can't just make him Savior over my life. I have to make him Lord over my life. That's right. mm -hmm. And if he's Lord over my life, that means I have to do the things he tells me to do. If I make him the Lord over my, 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 my life, I can't be a fan in the stands waving them on going, Yay, Jesus, go for it. i got to get down and dirty and get on the field and get in the game. That's right. Mm -hmm. right. And that takes discipline. It takes work. It takes some doing some things that my human nature tells me not to do. The scary part that I have in the world today is I don't think it's as easy to get into heaven as some people make it out to be. <laughs> Jesus says you can enter the kingdom of God only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and the gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few find it. Yes. Right. Now, I just don't think it's that easy to get into heaven as some people make it out to be. Scripture reference. Scripture I'll get it for you. I don't, I don't have it written down. Okay. Now, the other thing about Mark's gospel, if you like excitement, if you like action movies, this is the book for you. I'm telling you. I've already said John Mark records more miracles than any other gospel. There's two miracles in the gospel of Mark that are recorded in no other gospels. Somebody once said the gospel of Mark is the gospel of immediacy. Another person said the gospel of Mark is like the cameraman of the gospels. Click, 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 click. Snapshot after snapshot after snapshot. It's like the, the people used to stand on the corner going, extra, 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 read all about it. You know, this is the gospel of Mark. In James for the Bible, the word and is used 1,331 times. And, and, and. He's like the kid that goes to Disneyland and just can't wait to tell everybody what happened today. He can't get it out fast enough, you know? This happened, and this happened, and then this, and this, and this, and then this happened. But I'm also like J. Gordon McGee in this respect. I didn't actually count 1,331 ands, but if you don't believe my source, you're certainly welcome to do so. <laughs> One snapshot after another. You know, all headlines, all action. That's the gospel of Mark. Mark uses the word immediately and words like it, that the words that mean the same thing, like suddenly, right, right away, more times than all the other gospel writers combined. Action packed, full of miracles. Now, the other thing that's important to know is who, who was. John Mark writing to because he wasn't writing to the Jews, and that's important. He was writing to Christians in Rome. He was writing to Gentiles. He was writing to those who were not of Jewish faith. And we know this because Mark John skips right over where the other Gospels start. He skips over the genealogy. He skips over the birth of Jesus. He goes right into the action. And that's because a non-Jewish army wouldn't know anything about the Old Testament. They wouldn't care about the prophecies of the Old Testament that had been fulfilled because they'd never read the Old Testament. They didn't care that things were predicted in the Old Testament because they never read the Old Testament. But this audience of Roman Christians was beginning to feel the persecution of, of the Roman Empire. It's about the time, slightly before, Nero comes into power and Nero tries to wipe out Christianity. And he does it by torturing and killing the Christians. So these Christians are starting to be in fear of their lives. They're starting to suffer. So John Mark presents the gospel in a way that no other writer does. He shows Jesus as this suffering servant to give these Gentile readers, these non-Christian uh, uh, people in Rome, hope for the suffering they were going through. Hope for the suffering they were doing in the name of Jesus. Hope in a living God who had suffered himself and came out on the other side. The Gospel of Mark gives us his hope and his peace and his love to everyone. See, that's the important part about not writing to the Jews because he's saying this isn't just for the Jews. You know, the Jews think the Messiah was just for them, but this Messiah, this Christ, this King, this Son of God, it's not just for the Jews, it's for you too. It's for everybody. That means it's for you and it's for me. It excites me. The Gospel of Mark, John Mark presents to the Roman audience, and the Roman audience, can you remember, Rome worshiped many, many gods. And he shows them the one true <laughs> God. The, the Gospel of Mark has this one theme that, that's reoccurring, and that is Jesus, the Son of God, the suffering servant. 
John Mark tells us this God who suffered all on our behalf, and he calls some of us to do the same. And this God of servitude who now wants us to be servants as well. But John Mark doesn't wait about a God the Romans were used to worshiping. He doesn't wait about a God that was far, far away from them. They don't write about a God that you couldn't experience, that you only knew about. He doesn't write about a God that they had never seen. They don't write about a God that was dead. He writes about a God who wants a personal relationship with them. He writes about a God that they, they, have, they have seen and they have touched, according to Peter. A God that came in a body. A God who was incarnate. A God who walked among us. A God who loved us so much that he came so we could know him personally. He writes about a God, not one that was alive and then dead, but one that was dead and is now alive. John Mark presents to this Roman audience a God that they had never seen before, a God that, that, that was personal, a God that was relational. I mean, the gospel of Mark is really just this, this wonderful gospel for somebody particularly who doesn't know a lot about the Bible. Because the other reason we know that John Mark wrote to, to non-Christians is he explains a lot of things. He explains the Aramaic words. Aramaic was the, the language Jesus spoke most often. The Bible was written in three languages, mostly Hebrew and Greek, and some Aramaic. But Jesus spoke Aramaic. So when John Mark was writing to these Gentiles... He, he would explain to them the uh, traditions of the Jewish and why they were doing what they were doing. He would explain the Aramaic words and, and what it means. The other thing about uh, John Mark, it's about 40% of his gospel, almost half, not quite, about 40% of it has to do with the last week of Jesus' life. It has to do about his death and his resurrection as he heads to the cross. And that's good news for us as we start this study because the Easter season comes really early this year. The Easter season starts on February the 10th, which is only a month from the day. It's the Wednesday that's known as Ash Wednesday. And the Odyssey Church is going to have our first Ash Wednesday service this year at 6.30 on, October, or on February the 10th. So we would ask you that if you don't know a lot about the season of Lent or if you don't know a lot about Ash Wednesday, put February the 10th, 6.30 on your calendar now. I think it's going to be a great service. The season of Lent is sort of like a spiritual house cleaning. It's a time of looking at our lives. And if you're not familiar with it, you know, come and uh, see some of the things that uh, God has for us that evening. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about my dad. My, my dad was a, a really fantastic craftsman. He was a, he was a really good carpenter. But he was also a very good manager in business. He, he managed a, a, a large lumber company. And he was the assistant manager in Salisbury, but Dad was good at his job. And there was a store in Knoxville, Tennessee that was having a lot of trouble, so they transferred my dad when I was in second grade. I was about seven years old to Knoxville, Tennessee. So we, we just moved up, and we moved from Salisbury, where I knew everything and they knew everything, and we moved to Knoxville, Tennessee. Now, it wasn't long after that when I believed that I found salvation in Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, like I said, I believe I was about seven or eight years old, and, and I know that you can't tell it by looking at me now, but the instrument God used to bring me to Christ was food. A friend of mine asked me to come to his vacation Bible school at the church that his father was the pastor of, and he promised if I went, I'd get a Whopper from Burger King at the end of the day. I'm thinking, this is a good deal. So that's why I'm always encouraging to bring people to our cookouts and our dinners and our things like that. Because I know that God still brings people to Christ through food. <laughs> it's easy to invite somebody to eat, right? Everybody got to eat. That's the same thing. The number one way people still come to Jesus Christ today is by somebody inviting somebody else. But I have to tell you, my relationship with God and Jesus didn't start out so well. At the end of the message, the pastor or the lay speaker, I don't remember what he was, but he said, for, he goes, for all those who like to put Jesus in your heart, raise your hand. Well, he, he, I wanted this Jesus, and I certainly didn't want this hell he'd been talking about. I didn't want no heart back, so I raised my hand. 
And then this guy, like I said, I, 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 I think I still remember what he looks at. I, I've been looking for him for a long time. He said, all of those who raised your hand go downstairs in the basement, and the rest of you go outside and get your whopper. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, I want Jesus, but I want that whopper too. <laughs> <laughs> so at the age of seven, I confessed Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord, and I wish I had the testimony of my 20-year-old daughter who spoke here the other day. Mm -hmm. You know? Wow. I don't have that testimony. Test, the greatest testimony is not the person who was in the pits of sin and was raised up. The greatest testimony is the one who never went down into the pits of sin. Mm -hmm. So just keep my daughter in prayer. Because the world calls them. Mm -hmm. sure. So the fact is, though, seven, you know, early eight, I, I'm, I find salvation. I've made Jesus my Savior and my Lord. But about eight or nine years ago, if I'm only in fourth grade, okay, that much I remember, I start smoking. You know, I'm young, fourth grade. My mom and dad were both smokers at the time. One of my earliest childhood memories was my dad giving me my, his cigarettes and telling me to go put them in the toilet. I remember one time I was four or five years old, and, you know, I'm going to try one out. <laughs> didn't go so well the first time. But that didn't stop me from smoking and smoking regularly by the time I was in fourth grade. By the time in seventh grade, I had it rolled up in my sleeve going to school. Things were a lot different than they were today. Smoking was not allowed in school, but we had a smoking tree. And as long as you went to the smoking tree, nobody bothered you. So me and all the other derelicts, we'd go out at lunchtime and sit under a smoking tree, and we'd smoke cigarettes. Now this is junior high, you know, how old were you in junior high, maybe 12? Now one of the things my dad did, right after he, he bought, a, bought, a, bought the first house we had in Tennessee, we rented for one year, and then he bought a house, uh, was to build us these playhouses in the backyard. There was a neighbor right behind us who became really great friends, my mom and dad, their mom and dad, and they had a son and daughter, and there were two boys, me and my younger brother and my sister, we all became great friends. And my dad, being the craftsman he was, built a, a playhouse, what he called it, in the backyard of our house, and the neighbor directly behind us, which had a path already after a year, it was about that deep of us walking back and forth, a playhouse in their backyard for the girls. So we had one for the boys, one for the girls. Now. These were pretty elaborate playhouses. My dad was in construction. My dad worked for a lumber company. I mean, they had full front doors with the brass blocks and the whole bit and the wind in the back. And I'm just gonna tell you parents, if you ever build a playhouse for your kids, do not put the door facing the house and the wind in the back. Because the wind in the back is a great escape tool in the middle of the night, and you will never know. <laughs> but anyway, they were heated. They were electric, they were insulated. I mean, for all intent and purposes, these things were just little houses. So that became my smoking place. You know, I'm, I, I rent time one time, we, why my parents didn't kill me or how they didn't know, I, I don't know. We were about 10 years old and my mom, unbeknownst to us in the middle of the night, knocks on the door and we said, wait a minute. now." She's about 20 feet away, but when we opened the door, it looked like we had a fire in there. <laughs> but my mom and dad were smokers, so you know they never really picked up on it until I was probably 18 or 19 years old, or at least that's when they told me they knew. Mm. But then at the age of 10, well, you know, I'm introduced to marijuana. So uh -oh. I, I, I have to tell you, and I thank God for this, and you'll know why in, a bit, in just a minute. Um, I didn't have the effect a lot of people have with marijuana. I mean, I didn't give me the giggles. It didn't put me in a metal mood. It didn't. Um, it didn't calm me down. It didn't make me playful. I, it, it actually brought out every fear and anxiety I ever had. I mean, I was uh, uh, a uh, anxiety-filled kid to start with. You know, moving and uh, some other things, and um, man, it just brought it all out. I, I had the most terrifying night of my life. See, the thing was, I was starting to get farther farther and farther away from God. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you something, God never left me. That's right. If I hadn't right. had that experience, I don't know where I'd be today. I, I, I honestly believe I, I'd probably be dead. But at 14, um, my dad's transferred back to Salisbury, Maryland, and a few weeks after getting there, you know, we're you know, neighborhood kids, so I see somebody moving in or buy, the best way to find neighborhood kids is 
find out who's got bicycles in the house when you're a teenager, you know? So at, at 14, we move back and we become good friends with the neighborhood kids. And we have this, uh, what, what, I mean, we weren't there hardly any time, just a couple weeks, and we have this fort. Now, it wasn't like the playhouse that we had in Tennessee. It was every piece of scrap metal we could find, every piece of scrap wood we could find, every piece of plastic, but it was big. And it was hidden in the wooden lock next to one of my, what became one of my best friend's house. So he invites me to spend the night. We're going to spend, tell his parents we're going to spend the night in the backyard, but we're going to spend the night in the fort. And um, we decide that uh, it is a great opportunity to get one of the big brothers in the neighborhood to get us some beer. Uh -oh. So I never forget, we got, uh, each one of us got four little, whatever they were, eight ounce strokes. And that night, Everybody sucks down this, the, those four little eight ounce strows, and my brother, who was younger than me, and his friends, who were younger than me, and my, my best friend, they're all giggling, they're running around like they're crazy, and they're wrestling, they're doing all this, and they're singing. And I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, this ain't got no effect on me whatsoever. Mm. I have no clue what is going on with them guys. So I make up my mind, and next time I say, so, we do this next time, we're going to do this right. Mm. And that's exactly what I do. I got, uh, the next time we went out, I uh, got as they say, drunker than it's gone. Now keep in mind, I'm saved at seven. So God is still on my heart, but I am drifting farther and farther and farther away from Him. I'm so glad, I am so glad, that even though I left God, God never left me. His Word tells us He'll never leave us nor forsake us. And God was telling me all along the way what I was doing was wrong, but it's as if I was going, na 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 <laughs> So what that did was sort of trend that by the time I was 15 or 16, I was drinking on a pretty regular basis, if not every day. You know, I knew I had a problem the day we and a bunch of buddies went out, there was four or five of us in a car, and I said, hey, let's go get some beer. And the driver of the car turned around to me and said, hey, Rob, that's all you ever think about. There's more to life than drinking beer. And I thought about that, and I said, not really. <laughs> I found out that when I wasn't working and I wasn't uh, in school that I was drinking. And I knew it was starting to get a hold of me. So at 15, I get my, my first real job. I worked for a large department store. And uh, by the time I was 16, before I ever turned 16, uh, I was a hard worker. I was driven. Uh, they gave me, 15-year-old boy, to be the manager over six of the departments. So 15, 16 years old, I'm managing five, six, seven departments in this large department. Two of them were, well, were automotive and hardware, two of the biggest departments I had in the entire store. Probably why they're out of business, they quite honestly. But. <laughs> so, our 15-year-olds run the store, what do you expect? Um, but here I am, 16 years old, I'm addicted to cigarettes, I'm addicted to alcohol, and I'm addicted to work. I'm a workaholic on top of everything else. I go to school, work eight hours, I get off and work eight hours. And now, I've got the means and the money to support my drinking head. Mm. Now remember, two things. First of all, I said earlier, I'm glad I had the experience I had with illegal drugs and marijuana experience. Glad it was so horrible. And I also said, even though God was drifting, or I was drifting farther and farther than God, from God, God never drifted farther from me. He was right there with me. He placed, I didn't know at the time it was him. I do today, he placed two things in my heart. Number one, was I did everything to excess. I worked to excess, I drank to excess, I smoked to excess, I played to excess. Every single thing I did, I did to excess. I, I, I worked hard, I played even harder. And I knew, the second thing he, he placed in me, is I knew that if I did drugs, that I would overdose and die. You know, I would drink to the point of passing out, and I'd wake up the next morning. But if I did drugs, you know, that old saying for alcohol phenomenon, one is not enough, and a th or uh, one is too many, and a thousand is not enough. I, I knew to do the same thing with drugs, and I'd overdose and die. So I thank God that he put those things in my heart at that very early age. Because I was a drinker. My mom said, if you find something you like, you do it, and you do it well. Well, I like drinking. So I did it, and I did it well. <laughs> I could drink out, I'll drink all my friends, I could have to drink all their friends. <laughs> So at the ripe old age of 15, I'm going to school full-time, working full-time. I have money and the means to support my drinking habit, and I'm starting to become really good friends with the assistant manager at this department store, who's about 13 years older than I am. And soon I find out 
Not only is he the assistant manager, he's a fairly large and a fairly successful drug dealer. Oh my God. Uh -oh. <laughs> so, like I said earlier, thank God drugs are off the table for me. Because that would have probably been the end of my life. But we, we, we become good friends, and, and with the help of this uh, uh, assistant manager, I ordered my first fake ID. I don't know if any of you remember the kid's book, Boy's Life. Yes. 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 That's what I ordered out of. Yes. Back to Boy's Life. So, in the picture on there, I think I was about 12. But at the time, things were different, and it comes in, and I don't want my mom to find out it, so I sent it to my boss's house, my assistant manager, my good buddy. He comes in to work one day, I just had turned 16. He says, happy birthday, I think he's congratulating me late. He hands me this plastic card, my new fake ID. And it worked, unfortunately. So you gotta remember, it's not a big stretch, because at that time, 18 was the legal drinking age in the state of Maryland if you wanted to drink beer, and 18 was the age that you could get into nightclubs. So next thing I know, I'm going to school all day, I'm going to work for eight hours, and then I'm spending late nights out in the nightclubs with my 28-year-old boss, and now I am drifting farther, and I am drifting farther, and I am drifting farther, and I am drifting farther and farther. <coughs> I am far, far, far away from God. When Paul writes to the Christians in Galatians, he says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality. Sexual immorality. Impurity. Lustful pleasures. Idolatry. Sauce, sorcery. Hostility. Quarreling. Jealousy. Outburst of anger. self ambition, Dissension. Division. Envy. Drunkenness. Wild parties. And other sins like this. And then Jesus says, let me tell you again, or Paul says, let me tell you again, as I have told you before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that, Paul just described my life. I had died at that time, I believe I was put in hell wide open, and I would never inherit the kingdom of God. But God is a merciful God. God is a loving God, and for some reason he chose to protect me through all that. And I wish it stopped there, but then I go to college, I, I, I've got a business manager, but in, in college nobody forces you to show up. I wish they did. So I start staying out later and partying more, and uh, they had these things called dorms there. Very exciting places at the time, in all kinds of trouble. But in the midst of this, I land this job as the store manager of a uh, sporting good franchise in the old Salisbury Mall. So here I'm 18 years old, 19 years old, maybe 20, and uh, I'm the manager of a store. I'm going to school for business management. And I'm thinking, well, practical experience makes more sense than paying for experience. So I'm going to take this job. I'm going to quit college. And me and the college came to a, a very good agreement. Uh, Rob, if you quit on your own, we won't kick you out. And I'm like, okay. Uh, sounds like a good deal. <laughs> So I get married at the age of 24, and I got two kids, and I'm, I'm an insurance uh, I'm an insurance salesman, but I'm pretty successful at it. And uh, then I get in the automobile industry, and I double my salary. So now I'm, I'm making fairly good. <coughs> but there's problems in the marriage, and, and not the least of which was my drinking. There was a lot, but my party and drinking it certainly didn't help anything. So I go through a separation and a divorce right after my second child is born, my son Alex. And I am drifting farther and farther and farther and farther away from God. By the time I'm 30, I'm divorced. I've got two kids. I'm living in somebody else's house because it seems in the state of Maryland when you give up your marriage, you also give up everything you own and <laughs> give up your house that you bought before you ever met them, you know, that kind of stuff. But I am a driven workaholic in addition to everything else. So I'm moving up the corporate ladder pretty fast. 30 or 32, I'm making what most people today, even today, 20, 30 years later, would consider a lot of money. I'm at the top of my game with about a six-figure income, a general manager of an automotive franchise with six brand names and 100 employees under me. I've got my youth. Uh, I've got uh, money. Uh, I miss the youth and the money. Uh, I've got power. I, I'm working for this six-car franchise, so I can drive anything that I want. If I'm going to an important business meeting, I drive a luxury car. If I, if I want to go out on the beach, I just go get a four-wheel drive. If I want to move some stuff, I get a big truck. If, if I, I want to go out with my friends, I get a sports car. If I want to impress the ladies, I get a convertible. I mean, by, <laughs> really, by world standard, I got just about everything the world will consider success. Now remember, I am not living from God. In fact, I'm so far from God, if he, if he stood in front of me, which he probably was, I wouldn't even recognize him. God still lives in my heart. I've left him, but 
He's not left me. God has this wonderful way of coming to us when we least expect it, when we don't know it, and maybe even when we don't want him to. I mean, I'm having a lot of fun. <coughs> but I hire a man to be the manager of our Toyota franchise. And this man, even though he's a little bit older than me, um, he lives in Salisbury like I do. We work in Milford. It's an hour, hour and 15 minute drive. So it just makes sense that, that we work together and we become good friends. He likes to drink as much as I do. So we usually close down the dealership between 8 and 9. We go to the store. We go to their store. We get what we need. We come back and we do paperwork for about two hours. These are long hours in the car business. And uh, after we get all the paperwork done, we drive home. Now, somebody asked us how long it takes us to get home. We had a simple answer and it was never about an hour and 15 minutes. We said just about six beers. So we would stop by the package store after we all ran drinking, pick up two more six packs, that's for the way home. Now unbeknownst to me, this new friend of mine is a fallen pastor. He was a pastor one time mm. who fell from grace. Mm. So on a ride home, we're drinking, but the conversation always turns to God, the things of God and Jesus Christ in the Bible. Mm. So here we are, far, far, far away from God, but the directions of our conversation every single night are about God. Hmm. So about, you know, two years later, I, I'm, I've now gotten remarried. I've risen up the corporate ladder as far as I could possibly go. So I, uh, instead of working with somebody else, I opened up uh, the first of what would be two different <coughs> three young car dealerships. And my buddies would come around after night and they would uh, sit around and we would drink while I'm trying to do what's necessary to to get this business up and running. Now, as you might imagine, this ain't sitting too well with my new wife. You know, I, I'm working still 14, 17 hours a day. I'm still <coughs> drinking. I'm still partying. We've got two kids at home. But still, the conversation sort of comes around to contrasting things. Drinking and God. But I've met the love of my life and I want things to work out and you know obviously there's some problems. Because of and I, and I, and I, and I don't want to bad mouth her but, and, and, uh, so I'm careful but because of some things that uh, my ex-wife had done because of uh, some things that happened in her childhood uh, she had some emotional problems and uh, they brought out a, a lot of anger at the time. Uh, because of that, I got custody of my kids. So I'm married. I've got four kids at home. <laughs> and on the outside, honestly, everything looks great. I've got a new business. It's successful uh, for the most part. Um, we got money. We got cars. We got a big house. We got kids. We're married. I'm driving home by myself one time, and you know, we just left and probably had a couple beers. But I'm thinking to myself, you know, on the outside, there's people that want to be me. On the outside, there's people who want to live like I'm living right now. But on the inside, I am really messed up. And I need to get it together. So I come home that night. Now, what I didn't tell you is me and my wife met at the bar. First, first, first couple years of our life was just partying together. You know, that's what we did. We had four kids, so we just had everybody come over our house. We put them in bed. We stayed up all night and party. <coughs> but my wife never had a drinking problem. I did. So I go home to her and I say, you know, you know I've been thinking a lot. Um, I really need to get it together, but I can't do it without your help. Mm. So I want to quit drinking, but I can't do it and sit here and watch you drink. I need you to quit drinking and I want to start going to church. My wife looked me in the eyes and she said, if that's what you want, we'll quit tonight. We'll be at church on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. So I want you to know something. God sees around corners. Here I am. I am so far away from God that I can barely see Him. My dad had died and I got angry at God. I, I, I've had all kinds of things that have drove me away from God. But the thing was, God had never left me. That's right. Mm -hmm. You got that right. That's what the scriptures say. Now, all this didn't happen overnight. I don't pretend like it did. I didn't have an experience where I went to the altar and everything changed at once. And I don't think Christianity is about perfection. And Christianity is about progression. But I want to tell you something. I stand before you today to change me. I stand before you today as a man living for God and not himself. I haven't had alcohol in many, many years. I tell you a story about God miraculously uh, took cigarettes away from me. 
and damn proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ hopefully not just here on Sunday mornings but every day of my life I had wandered very very far away from God now I'm trying to be transparent this morning I'm not doing this to glorify the devil and his work in my life I'm not trying to make myself something that I'm not I'm not perfect by any means and those of you that hang around me I long enough know that don't ever keep your eyes on me always keep them on Jesus but I want you to know, no matter how far away you are from God, no matter what you've done, no matter how mad you've been at Him, you can't run far enough away from Him that He's not still with you. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And if you're angry with God, or you've been very far away from Him, or you're in the midst of sin, or thinking about going to sin, God said, if you know what, you don't have to clean yourself up, just turn around, because when you do, you're going to bump right into me, because I'm right there all the time. You find yourself wanting to run away because of the pressures of life, or your past sins, or your current sins, or your anger, or whatever it is, in just the first eight verses of the Gospel of Mark, he gives us four proofs of God, which should bring you comfort, bring you hope, bring you peace, no matter how far or how close you are to God today. And since this is a church, we probably ought to read some scripture, right? Yes. I'm going to read to you just the first eight verses of the Gospel of Mark. That's the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 1 through 8, if you have your Bible, you don't, the words going to be up here on your screen, and we'll see if uh, Kelly can keep up this one. <laughs> This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. I mean, Mark just comes out of the gate telling us about him. This ain't about somebody. This is about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, otherwise translated as Christ or the Anointed One of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written, Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will repair your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. This messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food he ate locusts and wild honey. John announced, Someone is coming soon who is greater than I am. So much greater that I am not worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sins. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 In just these eight verses, we see four great truths of God. Mark jumps right out of the gate. He says the first proof of God is the fact that God always keeps His promises. Yes. And the second truth of God is a promise. And it's a promise that those who are very, very, very far away from God, God is still there waiting. You can't be so far away from God, you can't turn around and come back to you. And when you turn around, you're going to bump right into Him because He's had your back the whole time. Never left him. He's just been waiting for you to turn around. See, sometimes come back to God. All we need to do is give ourselves permission to come back to God. All we have to do is give ourselves permission to turn around and start walking towards Him instead of away from Him. And then He gives us a promise for those who are very close to God. John Mark gives us instructions those who claim to be Christian, those who are very near to God. And finally, the fourth truth John Locke gives us is that this is a promise not for the Jews, not for the Gentiles, not for the males, not for the females, not for the black, not white for the white, not for the Asian. This is a promise for everybody. Sometimes the only thing we need to do to get close to God is simply turn around. John Locke packs a ton of information in just the first eight verses. So I hope you'll come back next week.